field trip. How many times have you been down this river? No, I haven't been any times. Before. Never? No, I have never been in on the raft before. You've never even been on a raft before? Never, yeah. <laughs> I was hoping you might show me the ropes. This is one of the largest of Nepal's rivers, and Nabaraj's department monitors the flow of all of them. How much of this water comes from glaciers? I think uh, this uh, river has a significant contribution from the snow melt. Most of it's from snow melt? Yeah, most of it. All Nepal's rivers start in the high Himalayas and carve their way south, eventually feeding into the Ganges, which supplies almost 10% of the world's population with water. But when a high glacial melt rate combines with heavy monsoon rains, it can cause devastating flooding in low-lying India and Bangladesh. So Nabaraj's work is crucial for providing an effective early warning system. I'd been rather enjoying drifting towards Pachuagat, one of his more out-of-the-way monitoring stations, when suddenly things got a little more interesting. This looks like quite a serious rapid. Go. Ah! There's a huge rock there. These guys have to know where they are. There's another one, big one there. We got a stairway. <laughs> oh, hi. How are you doing? What do you think of that rapid? <laughs> like many isolated rural villages in Nepal, Pachuagat clings to the side of a steep river cut valley. Although over 80% of Nepalese people live in the countryside, less than 20% of the land is flat enough to grow anything on. The rest they have had to carve out themselves to make terraces, often as high as they are wide. I don't actually see a village. Where is it? Yeah, it is up on the cliff. I had a feeling you were going to say that, so yeah. we've got to climb up there. Yeah, we have to climb up to go to this village. I wondered how long it would take me to get used to living on such a steep incline. It all seems such hard work. Every morning, the women of Pachuagat harvest grass for their cows to eat from slopes which are too steep even for terracing. It was a 40-minute climb to the village, where we met with the hydrology department's faithful clerk, Beardus. Namaste. For the last 13 years, Beardus has, without fail, recorded the depth of the Sunkozi River three times daily. This is 8 in the morning, mm -hmm. 12, and then 16. And 4 o'clock in the yeah, afternoon, right. No sooner had we climbed all the way up to the village than we were heading back down again on a different but even more precarious path. Nabaraj was here to measure the river's current. He brought with him a flow meter which he was going to dangle from a specially constructed cable car. <laughs> is that it? Yeah, yeah, this is the cable way <laughs> by which we measure the flow. Three or four times a year. And it's safe, is it? Yeah, I think it is safe for our instrument and two persons at least. <laughs> yeah, I'm not that concerned about yeah, the instrument, yeah, yeah. it's the persons yeah. that I'm yeah, thinking of. Yeah. Okay. I hadn't told Nabaraj about my vertigo, but knew that if I was ever going to overcome my fear of heights, I should force myself to do things like this. Now, now's the time, isn't it? Because we're at least on, on land. <laughs> <laughs> I like your confidence. Fine. But as soon as Bearder started winching us out over the river, go, go, go. I began to seriously regret my decision. Is the trick not to look down? No, no problem. <laughs> it may not be a problem for you. Somehow, I found myself swaying about 
in a rudimentary cable car suspended 10 meters above a river, and all in the name of geography. Has anyone ever fallen in? No, nobody has fallen over until now, until today. What do you, what do you mean, until today? No, I mean, uh, since we started to measure the... Measure no one's ever fallen over? No, no. Don't no. say until today. Oh, OK. Bad bomb. Bombs away. But once we began taking the measurements, I gradually realized that looking down was no longer making me feel quite so uncomfortable. It's nearly there. Yeah. There. Bang. They have to... In fact, I was rather enjoying helping Navaraj. This one? 1.37. 1. 1.37. And that felt like progress. I've been afraid of the cable car, but it was actually all right dangling in midair. So I think I realize now that it's steep slopes, a connection between me up above, whatever's down below, and that's what does me in because interestingly it was the path down that actually I found more scary than the cable car itself. The next day I left Nabaraj and Beardus and carried on through the land of the terraces towards my final destination. Tucked into the foothills of the Himalayas in the rich and fertile Gurung region of Nepal is the village of Kadajum. Since before the Silk Road even existed, the Gurungs have harvested wild honey from bees which make their nests on only the most inaccessible rock faces. My translator and guide was the intriguingly named Hitman Gurung. We are entering the Gurung village. It's called Kadajung. So this is bee territory. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And this must be about the roughest road in Nepal, I think. This is fairly new road. That's this why is a I new road? Yeah. <laughs> so they built it like this? Yeah. <laughs> For the Gurungs, the twice yearly migration of bees through their territory inspires the most important cultural event of the year. But nevertheless, when we arrived at Kadajung, I was still more than a little surprised to see that the entire village had come out to meet us. Namaste. Namaste. It turned out that Hitman had told the villagers that I was here to train as a honey hunter, the first non-Nepali ever to do so. And you have to say namaste. Namaste. I was being welcomed as a hero, which was flattering, but rather alarming, given I hadn't actually done anything yet. And wasn't at all sure that I'd be able to overcome my fear of heights sufficiently to live up to their expectations. The welcoming party continued all the way up to the village, which, not surprisingly, involved another steep climb. One step at a time. When we arrived at the headman's house, our home for the next few days, we were put on display on the veranda. We have to take out the... Of course. By the evening, however, I'm glad to say the excitement had worn off and Hitman and I were invited to attend a very important meeting. The Gurungs believe in their own mixture of Buddhism and animism. And to find out the best day to go honey hunting, the village elders consult the local gods. They are marking the north, south, east, west, and where the big cliff is located. Getting it wrong, they believe, will lead at best to a poor harvest and at worst to accidents on the cliff face. Because someday they can't do it, like a, a Wednesday. You so can't do it at all on Wednesdays? No. But the final decision is based on the phases of the moon, laid out in their astrological calendar. A third of monks here, uh, Thursday, is a very uh, best day during this week. Is it? Yeah. The date was set, and there was no turning back now. That night, I hardly slept a wink. 
The whole village was expecting me to become a courageous honey hunter. And no one had considered for a minute that I might be afraid of heights. After all, living here, everyone seemed to spend their whole time climbing up and down things. Whether they were building giant haystacks or harvesting fresh fig tree leaves to feed their buffaloes. Vertigo just wasn't a word they seemed to understand. It was increasingly clear that growing up in such a steep country means that the Nepalese have learned to take living on the edge of things very much in their stride. And my vertigo wasn't the only thing playing on my mind. One in a hundred people have severe, potentially fatal, allergic reactions to bee stings. But I'd never been stung before and didn't know if I was one of them. This is the lug house snake, which is for the domestic bees. So Hitman had suggested a little experiment, using a bee from one of the local hives. The bees we'd be facing on the cliff, Apis laboriosa, are the biggest and fiercest honeybees in the world. Sure. OK. So I'm ready. But for our purposes, one of these domestic bees was going to be quite big enough. I got a stung here already. <laughs> <laughs> what, just like that? <laughs> Here you are. Uh, they come to see you. Have you got one? Yeah. So how... how... Oh yes, I can see right on there. Oh, uh, it's, it's okay. That's the bee? Yeah, this the is the bee. Sacrificial bee. <laughs> yeah. Go. Go ahead. Sting. I'm your enemy. <laughs> Surprisingly, though, bees don't always sting on demand. Come on. Oh, ay get it out of there, yes. Pain, and it's sort of see, seeping through my entire forearm. Uh, it, it, it'd be uh, about uh, four or five minutes, then after it'll be okay. I have to admit that part of me was secretly hoping that I would have an allergic reaction to the sting, so I'd have the perfect excuse to back out of tomorrow's honey hunt. And the cliff bees are bigger, are they? Uh, yeah. yeah and definitely. therefore more powerful yeah. stings. Yeah. yeah. But an hour later, all I had to show from Hitman's experiment was a sore arm and an increasing sense of dread. On the final leg of my journey through the steepest country in the world, I joined the Gurungs of central Nepal. Somewhat against my better judgment, I had agreed to accompany Min Badur, chief honey hunter, on a journey which would culminate in the ultimate test of my vertigo. There was no turning back. I was being inducted into the honey hunting fraternity. And I was more and more nervous that I wouldn't be able to live up to their expectations.